Well, hi, everybody. This is Steve Healthy Napier. Welcome to the Oracle of the Self Group Coaching Session. I believe this is session number seven. And uh, today we're going to pick up where we left off. I'd like to uh, uh, start with an exploration of the path of self-discovery. Last time around, we did a rather thorough review of all the quick reference guides and that. So uh, hopefully you guys uh, uh, were on that call and you found benefit in that. Well, now the question becomes, well, how do we figure out what it is that we want to put on a change grid? Or what am I thinking about when I go about assessing my level of tension? Remember that the change grid is activity specific. So you can't say that I'm at this level of tension like it's your personality. Although I will tell you, those of us on the professional side could say that a long a history of seeing someone exhibit the same level of tension over and over and over. Those patterns do mean something. Those patterns could, in fact, be a reflection of something going on at their personality level. I'm not saying there's not a relationship that we could look at. And what I'm saying to you is that the change grid itself is activity specific. It is not a personality test. It is not trying to in any way determine what your preferences are, what your, um, what are some of the things they say, how you operate under pressure. Well, that, that's not what we do. We look at a situation and we say, as far as this situation is concerned, at this particular moment in time, this is what you happen to be experiencing. And here's why that, that might matter to you. Well, now the question becomes, well, how do I identify the situations that I should be looking at? And uh, that's what this whole idea about the pathwalk is all about. Now, a couple of sessions ago, I did introduce the pathwalk to you, but last time around, I said that I want to walk you through it again in a more thorough way so that you can see how we go about identifying the sorts of activities that we want to look at on a change grid. Um, now, all of you should have this form, but just in case you don't, let me go ahead and chat it over to everybody. Give me just one second here and I shall do that. So you all have this or multiple copies of it by the time. <laughs> uh, so Pathlock is what it's called. Uh, there you go. And I might as well give you the activity list again while I'm here moving files around. So uh, there is the activity list as well. So those are the two most important ones. And what the heck, in case you didn't have that quick reference guide, there you go, have the quick reference guide. So those are the three handouts we seem to be talking about on these recent calls. Now, the path of self-discovery is where a real, um, I wanna say, if you, if you hired a ChangeWorks coach and you wanted to go through journey or something like that, we would tell you it all begins by walking the path. And so I want all of you guys to do this. Um, and you can do it on the scratch piece of paper. You can just do it in your head. You can do it on the little fun form if you want to. It doesn't really matter. But I want you to get this real feeling for what walking the path really means. Um, so walking the path begins by coming up with some sort of generalized subject area. And last time around, I said I'd like to put together an activity list uh, for relationships. And I said, so all you guys can do this as homework if you want, just thinking about relationships in your life right now. What is your current situation? So when I ask you to tell me about the current situation, I'm trying to do what's obviously that. Describe for me, if you will, in true, concrete, measurable, provable facts, what is going on right now? I'm going to say that again. Remember, when we're walking the path, we're trying to do something uh, to move things into a logical assessment of what's going on. And as I said last time around, while feelings can be very valuable things, emotions can be very valuable things for us to have, to dwell in them, to live in them, is not a helpful thing. Uh, these do not become useful when we are trying to solve a problem, solve a problem. So this is why we're trying to say, set those aside. We'll get to them. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying get rid of them forever. I'm just saying, can we please do the logical pieces first? So white, green, black, yellow, red is our order. So uh, what's going on with your current situation? And the current situation, again, is concrete, provable, measurable, 
facts. If you, uh, if you start to present it as though it's an opinion, while your opinions may be a fact, they are not something that's helping you to really understand the current situation. So just set them aside somewhere. If you said, well, um, I just hold this really, this really strong belief that X is true. Holding a belief that X is true does not make X true. So to whatever degree you possibly can, you want to say, I want to discipline my mind to only look at what is concrete and real in front of me. Now, as you start to do that, or if you're helping a person do this, if you've got a change works partner, we're always suggesting people have a change works partner so you guys can get together between uh, these coaching sessions and try to do some application and support one another as they do that. We will tell you that as someone starts to describe the current situation, do not be surprised in the very least if they start to reveal feelings they have about that, they start to reveal opinions, they start to reveal uh, beliefs about things, um, if they start to give you whatever it is that cannot be described in true, concrete, measurable, provable, documentable sorts of ways, they're gonna start doing that. Now, why are they doing that? Anyone wanna unmute and tell me? Why is it that people's thoughts and feelings and intuitions and instincts and beliefs and all that can compromise their ability to describe, to, well, to see, first of all, the current situation as it truly is and describe it accordingly? David, you've unmuted. What do you, what would you like to well, if, if, if they're sharing feelings and intuitions and emotions, that would indicate to me that their tension's a little bit high and they're not able to actually engage in the white hat. Exactly. So I might try some downgrade maneuvers to get them a little bit more centered. Exactly right. So going back to the change grid, we know that if someone is up here in stress, power stress, there the further upgrade you go, the more emotion rules, reasoning, and logic moves to the back burner. And so as we get further and further upgrade, or talking about emotions, as we find ourselves getting increasingly upset about something, that feeling of being upset probably is accompanied by anger or fear or some sort of just you know discontent it depends on the magnitude how far up you're going to go uh, but nevertheless as those emotions creep into place they undermine your ability to see something in its true logical practical measurable form um, do you guys recognize that? I kind of need, need to know if you if you have another thought or an opinion about how you know whether or not these emotions are helping you see something clearly or not. I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, but uh, yeah, but what I will tell you is that after training this material for oh my gosh, almost forty years has it been forty years? Ooh, um, I can just tell you we've talked about this a whole lot, and we've got our uh, our understanding is you know rather. Uh, rather solid at this point. Being up grid, out grid, down grid, or in grid is not going to help you walk the path as well as you could walk it if you could just get you mid grid. If you could just get you into power in the center of the grid right there, that's where good things happen. That's our sweet spot for people to start learning and exploring and all that good sort of things. You pretty much want to fill every moment of every day inside of the green circle. You just can't do that because life yeah. happens between the green and the red. Yes. If we were discussing relationships, would it be valuable to ask the individual to share with us a relationship that they have that they consider to be in excellent shape Absolutely. and then analyze why that's the case? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I think that's a great idea because we don't just do one path walk. We can do a general path walk and just say, oh, let's just look at relationships in general. But there's also no reason at all why I can't say I want to look specifically at my relationship with so and so. And, uh, you know, really drill it down to that. Really, Those of you that are in business settings could say, I want to explore the relationship I have with my clients, the relationship I have with my coworkers, relationship that we have with our competition, uh, as, the, as the case may be. So you get to decide at what level you apply this, but it can be applied at all levels. Uh, to do that. So yeah, David, absolutely. You could, you could use it to drill down. The other thing that David was alluding to, and then TIC, you've, you've uh, unmuted there as well. So give me just a jiffy here, is that part of the developmental process, uh, when we are trying to help people uh, 
do a better job of self-coaching, more personal growth development, all the good stuff that comes from that is we want them to have benchmarks for what they consider to be an ideal relationship or an ideal whatever. Again, this is not limited to relationships. That's just what we happen to be talking about today. So it's great if they've got some sort of a hallmark that they can use to benchmark uh, how other relationships stack up to that one. Uh, they could also characterize uh, bad relationships that they have and see if they can identify some sort of pattern in there. That can be a really useful exercise because in that exercise, what the individual may actually be doing is revealing their values that they hold around relationships. So when they start saying it's a really this is a really good relationship and you ask them what is it that makes it good they're going to start telling you what it is that they use as those benchmarks those hallmarks of what a great relationship is they're listened to they're supported they're not <laughs> judged uh they're they're loved they're whatever they're going to give you a whole list of what they are looking for in uh, the relationships that they have and uh, to the exact same degree, when they start telling you what they don't want in a relationship, they're telling you, I do not value these things or these things go against my values. And I can't be in a relationship with someone whose values are so different than my own that I find them annoying on a good day and impossible on a bad one. <laughs> so, so there you go. So T, what did you want to throw in? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, really nothing right now, except I was thinking of some relationships, even my own, that, um, you know, what is a good one, what is not a good one. And I, I think people sometimes can I Id better identify what's not good mm -hmm. than what's good. Yeah. Um, and so you have to maybe put, get them to identify that, put that aside and say, okay, what makes, you know, what allows you to free breathe like, or something that mm -hmm. they can, you're you know, touch right. it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, just to quickly show people how what T was just saying overlays on the change grid. Um, one very interesting thing that we've looked at on the circle of brilliance in great detail and these the recordings of those discussions are all up on the YouTube channel again just go to youtube.com and do a search for change work system you'll find that by the way we hold the federally registered trademark on the word change works. And so we could talk to all those other channels that you're going to see change works being used, and, but we don't have, it's not our energy to send them a cease and desist letter uh, just because we happen to hold that registered trademark. They're, they're, no, they're not causing us any issues. Anyway, but you'll see that, but that's why you want to look for change work system because that's most definitely what our channel is listed as. Anywho, um, you'll find a series that we did all about Toxic negativity leads to negativity, leads to uh, positivity. We talked about toxic positivity. So we talked about all these different, we talked about neutrality. Where do all these kinds of energies sort of live? And certainly one of the things that you will learn is as you move away from the center of the change grid in any direction, the chances of encountering negativity increase, increase, increase. So negative situations do tend to move people to the four extremes on the change grid. So you're absolutely right. If someone is locked in a kind of a, a negative sort of a mind space about a relationship, they're going to pay more attention to that. Again, the rule is people pay attention to where they find their attention. As a result, bad news will always capture more of our attention than good news does. Um, gossip will always uh, gra grab more of our attention than finding out that someone got praised for something is going to do. It's the way we're wired as humans. The more negative a situation is, or perhaps we look at it in how it's actually manifesting, in a profoundly threatening situation, that would be upgrade. Uh, that's a negative situation. I don't want to be there but I'm there and that's going to pull me into saying and thinking and doing other sorts of things. So, so that, that's one thing absolutely for sure. Negativity uh, gets a lot more of our attention because, and by the way, even if we go all the way down grid, down to deep, deep apathy, I can tell you that one of the things that happens to people as they get deeper and deeper and deeper into apathy is that they begin to retreat into their own little world 
where they believe that they know it all, everything is completely under control, and the rest of the world can just be, you know, summarily ignored. They do tend to be profoundly judgmental, although the judgment is not necessarily expressed in an outward way. So these are the quiet grumblers. Uh, these are the the, the people who um, just. Uh, I don't know. They're, they're, they tend to be quite depressed and uh, everything that comes along with that. But bottom line is you're going to find a lot of negativity down here as well. And that negativity is going to impact. Yeah, T, what else did you want to add? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. Kate must be hitting something. Oh, no. then we, you know, but <laughs> while, while you're open, feel free. Oh, oh I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> The other thing is, is that every time they go into negativity and they talk about it, it's like they've got to shake it out of their system. Exactly. And so I physically ask them, uh, okay, let's shake this off. Mm -hmm. so yeah. that and rebalance and get into talking about, you know, what you really want and look for. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, you know, the human brain is uh, is really, um, I want to say this, I was about to insult all humanity, uh, is rather simple in, uh, in many regards. And one of those regards is that the brain really doesn't know the difference between an experience that is real and happening or one that is vividly imagined. And it will respond accordingly. So you know, you know, you've had nightmares where you wake up and you're having a full-blown stress response physiologically, but the truth is nothing was really happening. It was all in your mind. And so there are many, many cases that we encounter where people have actually had a truly unfortunate negative experience. Something happened at some point in time that threatened them in some way, or made them very angry, you know, made them grieve over whatever. And if they go back to thinking about that situation, all those emotions come back with it. So what's happening is that you're moving from your cerebral cortex, which is ruled by logic, and moving more down into your limbic system, which is more about where the emotions and things like that uh, tend to be held. And so um, we have to kind of do something to recognize and interrupt that pattern when it's happening. So uh, let me again say this. If you are trying to walk the path and the moment you start talking about the current situation, and by the way, it'll hold true as the others come along as well, you start feeling yourself or recognizing the person you might be working with in a co-coaching kind of thing, peer coaching sort of a thing, you got to know, as David said, we got to move you back to a healthy place on the change grid, or you've got to move yourself. Otherwise, your ability to do an accurate assessment of the current situation is going to be compromised going to be compromised. I'm going to uh, ask you about manipulation in just a second around this, but uh, this is what I, I kind of wanted you to, uh, to, to know. Emotions have to be kept in a wonderful, very well uh, wrapped box that you will unwrap at the right time. So if you encounter them along the way, just find a way to put them back in the box, get them back in the box, get them, we got work to do. We'll get to those feelings sooner or later, sooner or later. I'd like to teach you a quick technique that on the circle of brilliance we've come to. Oh, David, you've unmuted. Go right ahead. I just have a question, T. So, so does that mean in, in uh, the committing phase of master stream mm -hmm. that when we're closing, we're, uh, we're uh, trying to uh, uh, apply limbic measures? Well, this is the interesting thing. If we wanted to talk about the sales process in, in uh, neuropsychological terms, it would be interesting to say that, you know how they've always said, people buy emotionally and justify logically. I think that's what we've, what we've heard. Uh, that we would like to think they're going to buy logically and justify emotionally, but that's not, not really the case. Well, you're just talking about those two sections of the brain. So some people walk into a sales scenario going like, I'm just going to move this person into more of a primal reactive kind of a state, awaken all kinds of emotions around something, let them feel as upset as they felt about something that happened long ago and let them now anticipate encountering a situation in the future where they're going to feel really bad. And by keeping them in that limbic kind of place, I'm going to get an emotional um, response to it, a reaction as far as decision-making goes, and they may very well do what I want them to do. 
And that could actually be far faster than me trying to say, no, 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 let's let's kind of let that go for a second. We don't need to feel anything around this other than the confidence that we can get this taken care of. So let's look at your situation. And now you start to go into the logic thing. By the way, you'd, be, you'd still be following the path. So you start to do all this logic uh, to try to bring it back. Well, that could result in a sale too, a more solid sale because it's based on logic than it was based on emotions. But if you are someone who sells something and the only thing you care about is getting the deal, because once the deal is gotten, you're never going to see these people again, you may very well use emotional manipulations as the way that you're trying to influence people. For those of you who don't do sales training or whatever, as a consumer, you should recognize this. If a salesperson is trying to awaken your emotions about situations from the past and or anticipated situations in the future, or maybe even a situation that's happening right now, though that's a little bit okay because it's still a situation that's happening right now. Anyway, you're being manipulated and you shouldn't be spending your money as the result of manipulation. You should spend your money based on a logical uh, examination of where you are and where you're trying to go and what's in your way and to what degree will that product or service or whatever someone wants you to buy going to help you get rid of those obstacles so you can get to your desired situation. So David, did that answer your question at all? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I, I go off on tangents, but hopefully you guys find them interesting tangents. Okay, so um, the technique I want to teach you on the circle of brilliance, we came to call the Bufflin Maneuver. Diane Bufflin is a clinical psychotherapist, and uh, she spends a lot of time working with people on um, cognitive behavioral therapies, these sorts of change your thoughts, change your behaviors, change the linkage, and we can take care of a whole lot of the things that might be ailing you. Well, one of the things that she says is that whenever you recognize that you are in one of these um, emotionally charged kinds of situations and you need to be in a healthier, more logical place to do the right thing in the right way, that what you should do is stop for a moment and just say, isn't that interesting? And the moment you say those words, isn't that interesting or isn't that curious or hmm, isn't that odd, isn't that what you're doing is moving your brain into your uh, cerebral cortex. You're actually now stepping outside of the emotions and you're actually evaluating the emotions. And so you can continue the statement and say, isn't that interesting? Why am I experiencing those emotions right now that were about something that I experienced years ago. What is the point? What is the benefit in me having those emotions here right now? And again, you're, you're up in your cognitive uh, thought process and you might be saying to yourself, it's not really helping, it's just making me feel terrible. And so uh, we have a, a, a way you go further. What you wanna do is thank your limbic system. You actually want to say this. It's part of the whole cognitive kind of kind of process I, I want you to kind of do. Okay, so again, you're feeling out of sorts. It's not helping you in this situation. You say, how oh, very interesting. Why would I be feeling those things? Why are these emotions back? Does anyone know the answer about why the emotions have come back? Anyone? Okay, well, and you can chime in if you get around to unmuting. Um, the emotions are all back. Oh yeah, Susan, go right ahead. Why do you think the emotions are back? Because they're not resolved. They've not been resolved. Uh, give me another uh, reason, uh, Susan or anyone else. Why else might those emotions have come back? So we haven't resolved the issue. That's absolutely true. What else, Chris? I see you've unmuted, Didi. Did they, did yeah. they ever leave? Did the emotions ever leave? Or have you just kind of like squashed them down someplace? Right. Um, Edie, what did you want to throw in? Just that things in the current situation are triggering it. There's an association like Pavlov's dog that triggers. Exactly. Because exactly. way when it first happened, you did establish a connection between whatever was going on at that point in time and how you were feeling about it. So to bring back the memories, and even if you want to say the unemotional memories of that event happening can easily trigger the emotions because of the learned association between those two things. Yeah, uh, Becky, what would you like to throw in? Oh, I, 
I'm a little late in my response, but I just wanted to say that in, uh, sometimes the situation just keeps reoccurring. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And as the situation reoccurs, whatever it is you've experienced all the prior times the situation occurred, get added together into one big pile of, of uh, whatever the emotions might happen to be. So hopefully a, a long life of great things happening to you make you feel even better when something great happens again. But, uh, you know, we tend to pay attention to attention. So usually it's those negative associations, those negative memories that are being triggered back here. So T, what would you like to throw in? Uh, just it's reiterating the same thing that I always say you're going to repeat the same situations until you learn right. what you have to learn from it so there has to be a learning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that you can move on and then reapply that learning so you you know failures are only because you don't learn from them. that's right you learn right. from that's them right. then that's a good thing and you can move on yep 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 and so uh, what everyone's contribute is spot on so Yes, it's unresolved. Um, yes, the the reason why it's unresolved is because we've never learned what we needed to learn to either A, deal with that situation or B, just get over it because it's better to just get it out of your system than it is to try to go and fix somebody else who upset you long, long, long ago or whatever. You, you know, like you can't fix other people. I mean, you could, you, they can fix themselves and you can certainly be there to support that process. But if you think they're going to change with, unless something else changes first, <laughs> I don't think so. So, uh, yeah, David, so sometimes it's the. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, Sally, go ahead. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's the people in your life that keep bringing those situations to the forefront. And so I would consider that being an obstacle. Absolutely. If I'm, would that be right? No, you're absolutely right. Because again, we tend to, um, um, uh, yeah, spending time with other people in our, in our lives, you know, I'm talking about friends, associates, whatever it happens to be. They're basically giving us some spiritual food, if you will, if you will, some social kind of food. And so they are feeding you. And if what they're feeding you is negativity, guess what you grow inside of you? So, And so that's where you have to decide whether or not you want that person in your life or not. Exactly right. Or if nothing else, just being aware that this individual has some toxic qualities or some toxic tendencies at least equips you to have your own, what do I say, buffers up, if you will, you know, because if you, if you think like I still have to be with them, they might be a coworker. They, you know, who knows? You might have to continue to find yourself in close proximity to them. How can you better insulate yourself? How can you let it go or let it slide right off of you? So so there are some some things you can certainly learn to function more easily in such a situation. But at a certain point in time, and given the uh, a certain set of circumstances, you might say, ah, "Life is short. I am not going to fill it with people's toxicity." And so, if they can't find some way to support me and bring me joy and blah blah blah, then it's just time for me to to let it go, to just let them go. And uh, by the way, they'll blame you. Uh, just so you know, they'll blame you. <laughs> so yes, go right ahead, David. Um, you know, for people who engage in or have a <clears throat> kind of a primary style of dysfunction and inability to regulate their emotions effectively, I always give them uh, this thing called the behavioral journal where you write down the date, the time, the people, the event, and the feeling that you had. And you do that over a period of time so that you can find patterns and trends in the data. I could see us doing that for ourselves if we have difficulty relating to uh, dysfunctional or toxic people. Well, right. And so let's take a look at the path and what you would just do. You would say, as far as this situation is concerned, verbalize it however you might want to do you can say this is the current situation this is the desired situation so i'll say this i might say that we're looking at the relationship that we have with person a well the current situation is that when i'm with person a i never um can be calm um uh, when i think i'm going to be with person a i dread uh, spending time with them uh, whenever I'm with person A, 
the only thing they're ever saying or doing or whatever is whatever. These can all be parts of the current sorts of, of situation. Um, so uh, yeah, and then you just say, what's my desired situation? Well, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd like to fix person A. But in lieu of that, then I need to either find some ways of being able to handle those situations more easily, or I need to sever that relationship and uh, find someone who can, you know, fill my life with joy <laughs> instead of whatever that all happens to be. So, you know, uh, to a large, large degree, we control who we allow to enter our life. So and one of those obstacles, T, could be the way that we react or respond to them. Exactly. In which case, because I might say now my biggest obstacle in reaching my goal is that they trigger me and they trigger me. They press my buttons in entirely the wrong way. I know they don't know that they're doing it, but they do it. I've brought it to their attention and it's not going to change. So the obstacle is that it ends up triggering all this emotion in me. So I need to do a better job of understanding me or I need to find a way to get rid of the obstacle that might be them. And that's where you get into what David was suggesting about a journal that could definitely be part of the solution that you might wanna look at, particularly when we're talking about understanding that uh, things don't occur in a, vacuum, in a vacuum, you always have a certain role in whatever it is that's happening around you. Even if the only role you have is that you're allowing it to exist, it's still there. Thoughts about that, David? No, I, I think absolutely. And, you know, the, the challenge that we all have as leaders is mastering our triggers. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, I always tell people, if you can't control your own tension, you certainly can't control anybody else's. Right. Well, and that's the whole thing, you know, going back to what we were saying, one of the reasons why negativity can be an issue, why it is that we don't want to be up in stress or let these emotions be, sorry, I think, be running things when I'm trying to figure something out is because I know they distort that reality. And um, I know that um, a great percentage of what I might be experiencing up there may be created by my mind more than actually being a real thing. If I can actually recognize that and interrupt that, then I can do that. Now, the question I asked you guys though was, why do you think that when we encounter such a situation, we as humans tend to have all of these negative emotions awakened? And you guys said some really good things, you know, because we hadn't dealt with the issue, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, but the one I wanna throw out there is, it is because nature is saying to you, the situation poses a threat to you. It might be a physical threat. It might be a psychological threat. Um, it might uh, be you know, a threat that could come in many other ways, an intellectual threat if you think the person might be trying to undermine your effectiveness or your outcomes. So, 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 but there is a threat afoot. And um, your nature, if you will, is saying to you, you cannot ignore this. So I'm bringing it to your attention. And now that I've brought it to your attention, please set aside the emotion that you're feeling and fix it. Because as long as you stay up in this emotionally reactive kind of state or downgrade in this, I don't care kind of state, um, what do you think is actually going to happen to uh, the situation itself? Is it going to change or just perpetuate? Yeah, it's going to be perpetuated. And by the way, unresolved things tend to grow and it gets to be a bigger issue, a more challenging issue to deal with because it's becoming more and more hmm, fixed into your way of thinking and feeling and operating, et cetera. Um, okay, so back to our little path walk for just a second. So we got to look at the current situation and again, turn off the feelings so you can look at this in concrete factual terms. If you are working with a peer in a peer coaching situation, then you want to be listening for any time the, that person you're, you're working with might start having feelings, hunches, instincts, intuitions, values, beliefs, etc., uh, creeping into, into play. Okay. 
Now, uh, and by the way, I, I did say values and beliefs because very often the source of the negative emotions we might be experiencing that far upgrade could be that we're projecting onto other people or projecting onto that situation, our value system, like we have the right to do that. Uh, but nevertheless, it's what we reflexively do. We tend to operate uh, from our own values, our own beliefs, our own whatever. Whether our beliefs and values and all that are genuinely ours or not is part of the whole oracle of the self kind of process but whatever um uh you know they're, they're going to affect whatever it is that's going on okay uh, all right so that's current situation concrete factual sorts of things uh do correct it if you find that emotion coming into play once you have completed your look about the current situation then and only then do you take the next step now listen to what i said there only after you have finished your evaluation of the current situation, then and only then should you move on to the next step, and that is the desired situation. As I go through this process, I'm going to be emphasizing to you again and again that you must walk this path in color-tight compartments or topic-tight compartments, current situation, desired situation, obstacles. The colors do mean something. You guys don't need to worry about that right now. It's just a fun little game we put together years and years and years ago to just make it a little more interesting for our audiences. But nevertheless, it's still current situation, desired situation, et cetera. So you need to make sure you're doing these in uh, in tight compartments, color tight compartments, subject tight compartments. Why? But because if you jumble up these thoughts and you go one moment from the current situation up to talking about them as an obstacle and then sharing a feeling. And so this is what I'm going to do because I want to get here, but oh, then there's this to look at. If you start to jump all through these different steps, you know, you're turning into a really ugly dance. Your level of tension has been completely, um, what do I say, discombobulated is probably the technical term for it. So it's just being thrown into chaos. I want to add order, the natural order to make the highest quality decision in the shortest amount of time is white, green, black, yellow, red, current situation, desired situation, obstacles, solutions, then whatever you happen to be feeling. Sooner or later, we are going to let you share. Um, now, this is a program we actually uh, taught extensively to executives, uh, and it was called Precision Decisions. And we would take this exact same form in front of an audience of C-suite executives or a big conference table filled with all of the director levels and above and just say to them, do you guys have any idea how much time you waste in your decision-making process and how much uh, chaos you create just by having open conversations around things? Uh, we want to apply a very specific technique in order to make a very precise decision in the shortest amount of time required. And so this is what we're going to do. And then, you know, uh, they're all now kind of observing one another and their ability. So we would say to that whole table of people, I want everyone to look at the current situation together and start sharing with us. And we'll be up there with a whiteboard or you know sticky notes or whatever. And we'll be saying, tell me aspects of the current situation. What is actually happening right now? And if anyone says anything or offers something that doesn't meet that, then what the whole audience is empowered to do is say, save that. That's about desired situation. We'll get there. If I've given the form, I can even say, you can jot a quick note down in that section if you want to make sure you're sharing it later. So I don't want you to forget it. I just don't want us to spend time talking about it until we get there in our logical process. And so you got to do this for yourself as well. If you're thinking about a situation and uh-oh, a feeling pops in there, can you write down just two words so you can let your, your body know, let your mind know? that you heard the message, you acknowledge that you heard it, and now you can move on to the next step of doing things. Uh, that's the safest way to move about uh, as you walk along this path of self-discovery. I've been babbling for a while. Any thoughts, comments, questions about anything I've said so far? I, I know it's a drink out of a fire hose. <laughs> and I know, by the way, the biggest, the funniest thing about this whole thing is that my intention was to put together a program specifically for beginners that would only talk about the handful of the most basic little concepts in the world of tension management. And suddenly you guys are get, getting the gifted students program. So <laughs> hopefully you're okay with that. I promise you it'll all fall. And I appreciate that.
Well, I'm glad, you know, I've never been someone who speaks slowly or holds back information. I've always said to whoever is hiring me to do a speaking engagement or a training gig, I, I train, I speak to the brightest people in the room. If that leaves some other people in the dust, well, I'm sorry, but I would rather leave them puzzled than bore the brightest and the best. And so I do have a tendency to give people as much information as I can rattle off in the time we have available, knowing that uh, you will, you may not absorb all of it, but you may very well get some insight into something that's very useful to you at that particular moment in time. So, that's where I'm at, because I'm in the beginner section. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so that's good. So you're a beginner, but you know this, uh, as long as what we're saying, you go like, that makes sense, but I need more detail or I would need to practice that. Yeah. But there's a reason why we continue to do training on an ongoing basis for all of our all of our clients and all of our students. We do training programs, uh, you know, multiple times every single week. And we have for years upon years upon years upon years. So there's always going to be more ongoing um, education and Everything else goes along with it. Um, I'll tell you that we've probably put together not less than 350 hours worth of training program uh, that we could offer to clients. Of those 350 hours, I would imagine that we pretty much only train 25 of those things. And even then, you got to give us a whole week to do that full-time training program for a whole week to cover those 25 hours properly, five hours a day, we got to have breaks, blah, blah, blah. So um, there's no shortage of material. Uh, we just have to do our best to make sure that we are stimulating the brightest and the best um, and um, not going so fast that people uh, start to drop off the call. I know I'm doing a good pace when I can look and see that I've lost no one who logged into the call. So that tells me uh, it, it's a good thing to be. Okay, anywho. Um, so current situation, we've harped on that. Desired situation. Now, what do you want? Now, when you answer the question, what do you want? What is your desired situation? There are two types of information that I want you to think about. Those two types of, of outcome information, if you will, are quantitative and qualitative. So depending on what the goal is, there may be some very specific metrics that you can share with that. I want X number of these things by such and such a date. So I want to make X amount of money. I want to spend more time with so-and-so. I want you can you can attach very quantitative measurement elements to uh, your goal. And that's a good thing if you got something you can put out there as an actual measurable, tangible kind of a goal. That's great. But there's also some qualifiable sorts of aspects to a goal. What kind of qualities do you want to uh, uh, realize as the goal is achieved? And so that might be peace of mind. That might be stronger, more authentic relationships. Those are the sorts of things that can I measure them? Not so easily. It's not as cut and dry as how much and how many and how often and those sorts of things. But it's something that we could definitely say, that's my true, my heart's truth when it says, what do I really want? I just want peace and quiet. I just want to have things be easy and uh, and on and on. So those are more talking about the qualities of a particular goal. So you want to be able to do a combination of those two things. As your training continues, we're going to get much deeper into how to really go about formulating a goal. Because, and it may very well be what we'll do next, uh, next time around, next Monday. But uh, I want you to know that at this stage, I just want to make sure that your goal is something that is quantifiable, qualifiable, ideally both of those things. So what do you want? Now, as I said, when we first started uh, introducing the path of self-discovery to you, I said to you, look, if you know where you're at, you know your current situation, and you know where you want to go, you know the desired situation, why aren't you already there? And the answer was, you are not already there because there is some obstacle or set of obstacles, real or imagined, that are in your way. And until you can identify and address each one of those obstacles, the chances of you reaching your goal are, well, let's say compromise at the very least, maybe prevented outright, depending on, uh, on the obstacle. Remember I said there's, uh, I'll repeat what I said, that if you are, if you know where you're at and you know where you wanna go, 
Why aren't you already there? The answer is because there is some obstacle or set of obstacles, real or imagined, that are in your way. And so if what's stopping you from getting there is an actual real obstacle, I mean, a, a, you know, we live in, in a real world that's got um, physical requirements, you might need X amount of money or X amount of space or whatever it is. If you don't have that, that is a real practical um, obstacle. It, it has to be dealt with. Where obstacles of the mind are more about your belief system, your value system, the frame you're putting around something, those emotions, those instincts, et cetera. Um, could become up to. Why it's important to know what the obstacles are is so you can say these are obstacles that are in fact, these are obstacles that are real. And over here, we got a whole bunch of obstacles that are just part of my mind. We're not trying to minimize them. We're just saying it's a different group. Why do I need them to be different? Why do I need to keep the, uh, the real obstacles separated from the obstacles of the mind? Anyone want to unmute and tell me? Why do I want to isolate the um, the kind of real practical ones from the more of the mind things. David, you've unmuted, go right ahead. Well, it seems to me that if they're imagined obstacles, then the solutions are gonna to be totally different than for real obstacles. Right, 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 right. Boris, what do you wanna throw in? I think feelings has something to do with it, with it as well. I mean, you, you could be not really, um, describe an obstacle. It could be just how you're feeling about that. Is it possible for your feelings to be an obstacle? Like a real obstacle, you, you can be uh, objective around it. Um, you, mm -hmm. you can define it easily, but a obstacle that is, um, you know, is, I guess, imagined, if you want to call it, there you, go. You, you have some feelings about that. Right. And those feelings are something that's an internal process. Mm -hmm. And that's why we call them obstacles of the mind. Mm -hmm. And so, because it's, a, it's really a process that's going on inside your head. You are responding mm -hmm. to it the way that a human will respond to it, but it's not in the same category as we've run out of building materials. We can't finish the build because the uh, supply chain issues and our, everything is back ordered and on and on. Those are the more real obstacles than those. And so you're absolutely uh, correct. And what David said was we have to deal with these in different sorts of ways. So um, now let's say that you guys were to get rid of all of the obstacles, the real obstacles that are out there. So there are no resources that are stopping you from going somewhere. There is no whatever it is, real, tangible, concrete kind of thing. Even though there are none of those obstacles, is it possible that obstacles of the mind can still stop you dead in your track? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T, go right ahead. What would you like to add? No, I was just saying, yes, they can, because that goes back to our earlier situation. Unless you um, address, the, you know, um, what'd you say? Unless you uh, understand what that threat is mm -hmm. or learn from it or say this is real or imagined, it, that, that can be a real obstacle. Yeah, absolutely it can be. And I can tell you in the work for, that we've been doing for all these years, and you guys can chime in, a lot of you on the call are coaches and therapists and consultants of different varieties. Um, how often have you found yourself in a situation where the truth be told, there is really nothing stopping these people from achieving their outcome other than the, the stuff that's going on between their ears, right? I mean, we, we deal with this all the time, David. I think that's absolutely accurate, T. And I'm, I'm wondering what the solution is for that. Well, um, I just think that when uh, on the professional side of things, we have to recognize that I keep wiggling around here to get for you guys to kind of just anchor a, a vision that here's all the practical kind of stuff. And over here is all of the stuff that's going on in your head. Well, these kinds of issues are best dealt with through our consulting efforts. So, right, we're trying to help people find more resources, get those resources. A consultant tends to deal far more on the practical side of things. 
uh, maybe a trainer, depending if the obstacle is simply a lack of knowledge, skill, experience on behalf of, behalf of your employees. Uh, so a consultant for sure, maybe even a trainer would fall into this category. But when I get over to this side of things, it's obstacles of the mind. This is where we may very well need to have a very different skill set, a very different kind of profession ruling our behavior. These are the counselors. These are the therapists. These are the coaches. If they're, we're talking about um, coaching in general, rather than performance coaching, which we, which would probably deal more with uh, the practical side of things, eh, maybe in between. Anyway, um, so I think that's part of it, David. The answer is that you've got to either have the skill set to do bo both of these things, or you need to have aligned yourself with another professional to say, when I'm encountering this kind of a situation, uh, I'm going to let them do this sort of a thing. I'll give you an example of this. I view myself as being a trainer. First and foremost, training is my thing. It's my passion. It's been my my career. Um, I do get pulled in to do coaching engagements. I can tell you that I'm okay with short-term issue-specific coaching. That means that we can deal with whatever the issue is in one, two, maybe three sessions, tops, and then we're done. Long-term coaching relationships with people starts to feel a little bit more like counseling, a little bit more like therapy. And for whatever reason, that doesn't fit me. So uh, yeah, so yeah, we got to do that. So uh, both of you that are on the call that are in the human development industry, how do you guys define yourselves and how easily can you go into the other disciplines that uh, you, you might need to morph into? Yeah, David, go ahead. I, I, I think that it's important to be aligned <clears throat> with someone like a Diane Buffalin or someone like that, because I, I have run into situations where coaching just will not suffice. Right. Right, right, right. And that's an important lesson, I think, for everyone who's on the call that's thinking about doing this peer to peer. Don't think that even if you reach the point of being like, you know, a, a facilitator in the work that we do, where we you've gone through enough training that you know exactly how to do this. That doesn't mean that everything that is uh, happening out there in the world, in your relationships, in your whatever, are going to be something that you can fix with this skill set. You can make great progress with this skill set, make no mistake about it, but there may very well be times talking about relationships in particular, where you might want to say to this um, toxic person, they need help. They need to talk to somebody. And that somebody may not be you since you're too close uh, to the situation, even if you had the skill set. So uh, T, what would you like to add? Well, back in eighth grade, um, there was a fellow that was in part in my grade, actually ninth, and he needed some real help. And my mother used to tell me, I said, well, I'm just talking to him. She said, no, you don't have the skill to just talk to him. Oh. You need to get him and encourage him to go see somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And so I have to tell you, that has remained with me a very long time, mm -hmm. um, like 200 years. <laughs> um, it's amazing. You know, I was really glad she gave me that counsel when I was a, actually a freshman. In yeah. high school. Yeah. I mean, that's really good advice because otherwise, you know, when people are just spending time with their friends, I think a lot of times what they're doing is sharing their pain. And then their friends, wanting to be sympathetic and empathetic, are going to acknowledge, perhaps support, encourage that exact same pain or support those emotions to continue because the person might just say, I just need someone to understand me. I need someone to, to tell me I'm not crazy. Uh, well, I need more tests done before I can tell you that one, but you know, um, I get that. And unfortunately, what that means is that these very helpful, supportive people might actually be fueling the problem rather than resolving the problem. And so that's probably what your mom was alluding to was that you don't know the right questions to ask yet. Yeah. So is that, was that where she was coming from? You think? Tina? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then, and I see this with kids on social media and all of that. They think they're doing good by listening. Listening is important, but the person still needs to have the, the expert help. Yeah. Absolutely right. And, you know, again, and I have a little thread just off the side of that. Sure. I think that for the trainers on this call, that sometimes you are uh, listening to a lot of these people and you're, you're absorbing their energy and their negativity. And so it would help 
I'm sure if you did have someone else to talk to about those things to help you realize what you're going through. And I don't know if I put mm-hmm. that in the right way. No, or... Sally, what you've just said is exactly right. Most people that are in the helping business, whether they're a coach or a therapist, a counselor, um, already have or should, and they've certainly been advised to have someone in their life that that they can go and like debrief with someone so that they don't absorb whatever the ick is that's all surrounding them, that they can stay clean as well. So I'll give you a, a, one quick story about this. I know we're coming up to the top of the hour, but Linda and I were on a cruise and we always, in the, this is the old days of cruising where you were assigned a table at a set uh, dining time. And we always asked for the largest possible table because we wanted to meet as many people as we could. Well, we were on one cruise and there was a gentleman and his wife among our, our 10 top at the table. And you could just tell that he was in a very sad and exhausted place. And at some point, I don't remember the details, but his wife shared that his work is really very difficult work. And so I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll see if I can at least engage him in some conversation. I think I might be able to, to be helpful in this regard. Come to find out, he worked for the New York City... I don't know what the name of the department is, but it had to do with the uh, juvenile uh, prison population and all of the juveniles he was assigned to had murdered their parents. So a parent or both of them. So imagine that that's the population you get to talk to all day, every day, you're talking to uh, juveniles who have murdered their parents. Might you need a vacation after a few months of that? So the answer is absolutely right. So what what I said was that you need to make sure that you're taking care of you. So are you seeing a therapist to help you not absorb all this negative ick that you're surrounded by or whatever? And so, you know, this is something you hear. And all of you will call that are coaches and and consultants, therapists, whatever. Uh, You know, you can certainly chime in and say, yep, they told me I, I would benefit from that. In fact, for coaches, before you can become a certified coach, you have to already do a whole bunch of coaching and be coached so that you can uh, kind of know what it's all, all really about. So that's that's part of the, the the those professions. But you're absolutely right. You have to do something to be able to cleanse your energy, if you will. Otherwise, you're going to get sucked in. Why is that? But because the human brain does not know the difference between a situation that is real and a situation that is vividly imagined. As you start to hear story after story after story from these truly troubled uh, teens who are probably going to stay in prison for the remainder of their life or on and on, how can you not absorb that? And so um, there comes a point in time where you have to be able to cleanse yourself of uh, whatever it is that's going on with you. Yeah, thoughts about that, comments? Thank you, I, I appreciate your answer. <laughs> well, good, good, good. And so this is to everyone. If you are finding yourself surrounded or finding yourself feeling things that other people have wanted you to feel. So maybe it's just something that's going on in the world and you're seeing so much on social media or news or whatever, you start to feel things that remember things that are not necessarily happening to you, but you are vicariously responding to these kinds of situations. The more that happens, the more likely you are to be moved up grid. That's a natural kind of thing. And you can you can learn how to insulate yourself and move yourself down grid. But you have to ask yourself, are the messages that I am receiving messages that are just not things being shared, but things that have the intention of moving me up into stress and keeping me up into stress. Because once I'm up here, my logic goes by the wayside. I stop scrutinizing things. I become that much more of an open receptacle for whatever their agenda items happen to be. I'm up in this distorted reality. So not a good place for anyone to be. How do you end up moving yourself down? How do you recognize when uh, someone is intentionally moving you up into that place? Um, Okay, thoughts, comments before we're uh, done? Interesting material, useful, anything, anybody? I just wanted to say that, um, unfortunately, I will be going back to work next Monday, so I won't be, I'll have to listen to these when I get home. And and, yeah. uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, so you can always about, reach yeah. out to us if you've got any kinds of questions, and then we can Thank either you. include them in the next coaching session, um, or I can just uh, talk to you privately about whatever. Thank you. Want. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Um, just yeah. And you can have this for next time or something, but you talked about toxic positivity. Yes. And I think that's a whole subject by itself. And sure. one I'm not really clear about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a nutshell, in the one minute we have remaining, it's when people have convinced themselves that pretty much by maintaining an unwavering positive mindset about everything and rejecting all negative information, knowledge, et cetera, that that's a way to live. Oh, got it. And so, and I'll share with you a detailed article about that. Um, in fact, T, I'll send it over to you as soon as I'm done with this. It's a uh, yeah, you might find it very interesting. Yeah, thank okay. you. All right, so thanks everybody for joining in. Have yourself a wonderful week and we'll talk again next time. Bye for now, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you, T. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.